My name is Michael Montalbano, and I'm very happy to be talking here today at Seattle Science Foundation. My topic will be an overview in general terms about pediatric hangman's fracture. Uh, as far as learning objectives go, uh, I think we'll be covering the historical advances in understanding about this pathology, the types of fracture that can happen, and how we can diagnose and manage it, manage it currently in the pediatric population. So for historical context, the earliest recorded incidences of hanging are noted to go back to Homer's Odyssey, about 800 to 600 BC, where a series of a dozen servants were executed for being disloyal. And this continued on until about the 5th century, where the German tribes were used predominantly against uh, Romans when they had their conquests back and forth. But it wasn't until about 1783 where we had a standardization, to use a lack of a better term, of the process, where the new drop model was introduced in London. That's pictured on the screen here. And it was essentially a model that was to be mobile. As you can see, it has several different labels and uh, could be dissembled pulled apart, uh, drifted around town by uh, horses. So the execution could be brought um, more efficiently to different places as needed. And it wasn't until about 1908 that people developed a deeper, tried to develop a deeper understanding of the medical underpinnings of this. So Fred, Dr. Frederick Wood Jones, 1908, exhumed about 100 uh, executed individuals, males. And the primary theory at the point at this point was that asphyxiation was the method of um, death. However, he noticed that there were fractures at the base of the skull, and he thought that it would be wiser to start looking at fracture as a mechanism. And you know, this cannot really be overstated, because up until this point, courts essentially said that someone's method of execution was going to be hanged until dead, meaning they didn't have a clear understanding of the process, and for those who are pro proponents of corporal punishment, capital punishment, this would be an advance in the right direction. And in 1965, we have what we now would call hangman's fracture coined. Um, until that point, the more proper term, you know, traumatic spondylolisthesis of the axis would be how it's referred to. Um, interesting note is that quite a bit of ink has been spilt over the term itself, hangman's fracture, because traditionally when a neologism enters the medical lexicon, it refers to either the person who discovered it, such as Parkinson's disease, or the person who suffers it, such as farm workers' lung. Uh, however, the hangman did not discover the medical underpinnings of this fracture, and he does not suffer from it. So there has been some attempts to rename it hangies fracture. However, you know, more than a half a century later, I don't know if clinical convenience is going to be exchanged for linguistic niceties. But on to the anatomy, you know, so the ideal execution drop point was about 2,200 feet divided by the weight of the individual in pounds. So for a normal male weighing about 150 pounds, you take about 15 foot drop. Now that amount of force going downward at 9.8 meters per second squared, and then the resulting taut rope pulling backwards is going to give you quite hyperextension backward motion in the neck. Um, this will lead to an avulsion on the neural arch here in orange. That's going to be your weak points that will give way first, just by simple laws of physics. And as a result, after these structural supports are gone, the body's going to fall forward, anterolithesis, spondylolisthesis of the C2 body. So this is traditionally what we think of with Hangman's fracture. We think of someone being, you know, having hyperextension after a fall. Um, however, this is important to note this picture here because this was the introduction of the submental knot, where, as I mentioned before, asphyxiation was thought to be the mechanism and it would have been a sub auricular knot, which would have been needlessly uh, prolonging the process and would have been more excruciating for the person, where this was a more uh, efficient, uh, you can argue, may a way of doing it. Now, the main mechanism of pathogenesis for um, this injury would be what they call submarining, where in kind of a mirror image of a fracture and then a slipping, this would be a slipping under the seat belt, as located here in the image. Um, then you have a flexion of the torso, the head snaps backwards, you have hyperextension, and that's where your injury comes afterwards. Uh, as far as variations go, 
There are many methods of doing it, but primarily, you know, it started with 1981, Effendi came, his paper came out. 1985, it was modified, um, and for sake of brevity, we won't go into those, but the other methods, but we will talk a little bit about these. Type one, you're going to have a slippage of less than 3.5. A 1A is a slight variant of that where there is not a parallel symmetric breaking bilaterally. Type two, you're going to have more than 11 degrees, so a greater angulation and usually a greater slippage, but there's a type 2A variant where there's less slippage. And then type 3 refers to any injury where there's a locked facet joint in place. So to proceed in more concrete terms, this is going to be your type 1 fracture, displaced less than 3.5, but still displaced slightly. This is going to have even greater angulation and greater displacement, if you notice. And then this will be a locked facet joint. A bit harder to decipher, but there it is. Um, diagnostically, um, there are a couple things to work forward and uh, watch out for when doing a pediatric evaluation. So synchondroses will be radiolucent on scans, and so up until about the age of 15 where everything fuses, um, these could be mistaken for fractures. You can also have pseudosubluxation, which would be a non-pathological slippage up until about eight years old. Uh, slippage forward of the disc, um, the body, sorry, and um, that's normal in about 25% of people up to age 8. You can measure it though, however, here is shown measurement of the posterior cervical line, and you can see that even though there is an appearance of slippage, everything still aligns. Um, as far as other measures go, a CT angiogram would be recommended if there is a suspected injury to the vertebral, vertebral canal or the transverse foramen. And you have different types of findings available, such as um, to differentiate, you would have perhaps a callus formation or hematoma present if it was a result of trauma, where if it was a primary spondylolisthesis, you would have a more symmetric defects in the pars articularis and sclerotic margins. And as far as prevalence goes, I mean, there are clear disparities between the adult and pediatric populations. You know, I could dare say there's a huge difference um, between the two that in adults you have about a third of vertebral injuries are cervical, and 4% of those are traumatic spondylolisthesis of the axis. And then the subsection gets even smaller in pediatric populations. So of all the spinal injuries, only about four happen in pediatric cases. And then of those, only less than 2% are trauma. So then you'd have to go to an even smaller subdivision to find the amount of actual data for Hangman's fracture, which is why it's uh, not well reported in the literature. But why is there this great difference? Well, there's a lot of theories behind that the skeletons are basically just essentially different at these points. So um, synchondroses, like I said, will be open until 15 years old. You have underdeveloped ligaments, which will have less structural support which means that up until about the age of 10, you're more likely to have displacements than fractures. And over the age of 10, you're more likely to have fractures. You can also have a articular facet orientation that's more horizontal in pediatric cases, whereas when after uh, you reach adolescence, they become more vertical. That will also increase your chance of fracture. And there's a higher center of gravity in pediatrics with a relatively large head mass. So that will give you a pivot point around C2, C3, whereas about the age of adolescence, you will get down to a pivot point and center of gravity around C5, C6, which again will influence the extent and region at which you have uh, any lesion that occurs. And this is uh, obviously not pediatric cases, but it does show an example of ALR ligaments in both the horizontal and then a vertical direction. So you have these disparities present and you can just see that the anatomical differences will make um, a change when physical forces are applied. So what happens? When should you take intervention? Well, first to take note, you should be cautious because as I mentioned, it is a very small subset pediatric population, so there's not a whole lot of data out there. Most of the data we have is from adults. Um, you could hypothesize and think that there are parallel findings in pediatric cases. Um, however, as Francis Crick said, uh, you not, can't expect all of the theory to be correct because some of the data will be wrong. These are not completely identical cases. But as far as adults go, in a stable, that is to say the ligament does not allow much mobility in C2, C3, 
In stable cases, you can have conservative management alone, so six to 12 weeks of immobilization. And then an unstable injury, you have more likely have to go to surgery, and you can have either anterior or posterior fixation. Anterior fixation um, will have a side effect, or a, sorry, so I'd say a complication risk of uh, swallowing problems, dysphagia, just as you can see, that seems to be obvious from the anatomy of where the screws are placed. The posterior, on the other hand, while it is superior biomechanically, that's also the drawback, is that there will be less range of motion after the surgery is completed. So what do we have for outcomes? As far as I mentioned earlier, uh, you cannot extrapolate too far into the pediatric population because most of this data has been drawn from adult studies. Um, but there is a chance of possible neurologic defects, which is unfortunate because this rate, you can have up to 25% of people will have a neurologic defect. However, it is not typically the case to have neurologic defect in pediatric hangman's fracture or hangman's fracture in general because the canal will actually widen rather than loosen with hyperextension. Um, however, after following up with patients for a year, about 75% pain-free, 75% have restoration of full range of motion, 40% are able to resume full activities, and another 40% will have very limited amount of activities that they cannot do, such as uh, high endurance sports. So that's a, a great improvement in the way these uh, cases can be treated, and I think it's worthwhile to keep that in mind in hopes of moving forward and having greater pediatric applications applied. And uh, these are our objectives. I hope you've gained a little bit of these understanding of these topics. And I hope I've entertained you a little bit. And I thank you for having me.